Hello, and welcome to Leadership as a Philosophy, Not a Checklist, Book Review 9 on Up from Slavery by Booker T. Washington. Now, a uh, couple of quick things about this book. I read this book a couple years ago, and I even really can't remember why. Um, I think I found a PDF version of it online. It said, oh, let me read that. Oh, I know why I read it. I read it because I read um, Frederick Douglass's book and went, oh, let me read some other books from back then was struck back then when I read it about how sort of natural uh, Mr. Washington's leadership ability seemed. And then obviously when I was working on this project, I just said, I have to put that on at some point. So scheduled it as, you know, like everything else, I got a year long plan I'm working through. So not too bad. A um, couple of things that are obviously interesting is that Mr. Washington was born 1855 maybe so he was six or seven when the when the civil war broke out and uh was born you know as a slave and then afterwards when he was young ended up working his way on a couple of different odd jobs ended up going to a thing called the hampton institute uh which is a place that was designed primarily by this guy named general armstrong to go out and create teachers to go out into the world and become teachers um whatever his behavior or activities were struck a chord with General Armstrong. And he said, Hey, I'd like you to go start uh, uh, an institute in Alabama, the Tuskegee Institute. So that's what Booker T. Washington's obviously famous for in his public speeches and some of the writings that he did. So they started out with nothing, had some poorly built buildings and not a whole lot of stuff. And basically we're running everything on a shoestring budget with the students doing a bunch of the work to create the raw materials or create the materials to build the school. Um, and it's a great story. Uh, the thing that to me is so amazing is, of course, it's an autobiography, so it's what he's writing about himself, but you hardly ever hear him complain about anything. He talks about how things were hard. Um, but I think one of my favorite little anecdotes that's not part of the leadership thing is that gives you perspective for those of you that have been to big banquets where there's going to be a speech at the end. He talks about how his least favorite thing to do was go to some banquet that had 14 courses and then have to speak at the end. And that was, and he said that was, that to him was more misery than when he was living in a little shack when he was a little kid and his mom was able to bring molasses from the big house and give him a little two table two tablespoon spoon of molasses he said that was that experience was more enjoyable to him than going through a 14 course banquet that, you know I'm, he's not wrong <laughs> anyway um so uh not a long review uh, because some of the stuff just jumps off the page it's so obvious uh the great thing about the book being as old as it is, is that it's available in PDF for free, a bunch of places you can get the audiobook for free. Um, so there's absolutely no excuse to go read it. And he's a he's a, an amazing example of a great human being and, and should be exemplified by everybody. It's like make that your goal. If you, you know you you could do many times worse than just trying to be as good a person as Booker T. Washington was. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to spend some time personally on my own going to read some of his other books. But this one to me was just, it just had a bunch of great stark immediate examples. So as always, I hope you enjoy and I genuinely appreciate you taking the time because I know there's a lot of content out there. Um, and for those of you that have been watching these all along, please provide comments or ask questions if you like. Um, sort of the next phase of this project is going to be to try to do more interviews and discussions with people about what I've thought about. So anyway, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Okay, so here we are getting ready to get into this book review. As I talked about during the, during the introduction, I read this book a couple years ago and thought, man, what a great leadership idea. So I reread it last summer uh, and then put it on the plan so 
there are a couple other writings by Booker T. Washington, and maybe we'll do those, but I think that they're going to be essentially, they're going to reveal the exact same thing. So, uh, first thing, points of interest from the book. Um, as we always like to do, or as I always like to do, let's talk about what makes the book interesting than just leadership. So, the quote that I just loved, because if you remember, we talk about the way that you make yourself the best at something is through competence, right? If you're the best at something and and you're in a functioning organization, then you should move up or you should get recognized for being the best. So he said, if you do a common thing in an uncommon way, no one will care who did it, just that it's the best. Um, he talks about that because he was trying to obviously with the Tuskegee Institute, if you haven't read the book, Dr. T. Washington found the Tuskegee Institute as we talked about. So um, his idea was that the, the students needed to have a trade that they could go out at. And if they worked to be the best at it, they were going to be successful because people want the best product. Nobody's going to say, oh, this is the most amazing thing ever, but it's made by fill in the blank. So I'm not going to use it. Nobody does that, right? Um, another interesting thing about the Tuskegee Institute was that students were required to do manual labor. So there were two different um, thought, schools of thought on that. One of them was that they it helped teach them the value of labor. And then it also helped them respect what they had done. So there's a couple of examples in the book where there were students that they or their parents just wanted them to get book learning. And uh, Booker T. Washington would not. He said, nope, if you're going to come here and not work, then then you you can leave. And so one of the examples is they were making bricks and he didn't know how to make bricks. They didn't know what they were doing. They had to go mess around in a couple of different mud pits to find the right clay to make the brick with. And some of the students quit because it was so nasty and disgusting. But the ones that stayed obviously went on to do good things. And so he had several times throughout the book, one of the things that he emphasizes is that you should have pride in your work. You should work hard. There's value in doing something that's hard and difficult because then at the end, you've got something great to talk about. It's just like the man in the arena quote from Teddy Roosevelt, right? If you've gone through and labored and worked with something and, and, and worked really hard at it, then you're going to appreciate the end result, whatever it is, even if you don't exactly succeed. Uh, he also gives an example about the students were also required to build or significantly contribute to the construction of all the buildings on the campus. And so uh, one of the older students saw another kid that was it's funny, you wouldn't think that there was graffiti back then, but uh, one of the other students was getting ready to write on the building. And the student said, Hey, 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 I built that. Don't mess with my stuff. <laughs> great, right? It's a great example. Um, and then he also comments on they had this thing that was called night school, which if you read the book, Booker T. Washington went to a thing called the Hampton Institute. And at the Hampton Institute, if you couldn't afford to be there, the, the guy that um, founded the school is a guy named General Armstrong, another great human being. And his idea was if you couldn't afford it, you would do 10 hours of work during the day and a couple hours of schooling at night. And the work that you did during the day paid for your school and you got a little bit more for your own stuff but you, you worked your way through school basically. So Booker T. Washington copied that in this example. Um, and he says the most successful students that went on to be the best examples of the Tuskegee Institute were the ones that started out in the night school. And basically you worked there for two years. And then if there was more schooling, you actually got that paid for, but you didn't have to do the 10 hours of work. You still had to do manual labor. Um, but I love that example, right? What, what better way to send somebody out to go take over a business than to have been doing the work, right? Um, and so that's, you know, same idea when we talk about leadership auditions or what we're teaching our kids in college. You know, you send somebody off to go work in a factory or be a manager in a factory and hasn't done a day of work in a factory. You know, what do you really know about what, what needs to happen? Um, all right, so this, I love this quote, and this quote, this was from 19, 1901 when this was written, and I just like it because it's 
important for now, right? So he's talking about General Armstrong. General Armstrong was a uh, Union officer, been wounded a couple times, had a couple of crazy things happen to him, was promoted to general towards the end of the war. And uh, Booker T. Washington's assumption was that when General Armstrong came to visit the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, that he would kind of be talking down and, and belittling and being a little rough and tumble with uh, the Southern white people. And he came down and was just as caring about the students at the Institute as he was at or with the people from the South. So he came up with this quote. He says, so I finally learned, he goes, I learned the lesson that great men cultivate love. Only little men cherish a spirit of hatred. And he resolved that he would permit no man, no matter what color he might be, to narrow and degrade his soul by making him hate him. I love that. I, take that lesson and apply it to your life right now. I don't care what position you have, leadership or not. It's just an important position. Are you going to let somebody? You going to let somebody else control your emotions? Come on. We all know better, right? But just amazing, an amazing quote. And he was talking about General Armstrong, white guy, but he still learned that lesson. But it degrade my soul by making me hate him. All right. So the funding from the Tuskegee Institute was primarily from donations and donations from the local population. He talks about. People bring in 25 cents for the Institute. Uh, there's one old lady that came in and she donated a half a dozen eggs. Um, another guy brought a blind horse. No, the horse was donated by the city. Another guy brought a hog. Um, but then he and General Armstrong started going around and doing a little bit of a speaking circuit, as well as uh, another woman that worked at the Institute. Her name was Mrs. Davis. I forget her first name. Um, and they went around and were fundraising all the time. And he talks about, you know, they had no money. They were broke all the time. Um, but they would get donations just in time to pay off the bills or pay the things or do all this sort of stuff. So, you know, you, you want to learn about how to, you know, about persistence and integrity and humility. This is the book to read. I don't, I don't care. I, I don't understand why this book is not required reading for everybody. Um, doing my research. And of course, you know, he was controversial in his time. Why? Well, I figured out why. I went and did a little bit of research and started doing some snooping and pooping. Found out that he was controversial because he emphasized that if blacks worked their hardest and were the best and, and, and were at the, you know, top of the competence hierarchy, that would do more to change people's minds than weird programs or lowering expectations. So his whole emphasis was, if you work hard and have good character, you're going to be a good person no matter what. Well, there's a whole bunch of people back then that wanted free stuff from the government, a bunch of other things. You can go do your own research on that. But I, I just love the fact that it's just, you know, 120 years ago and now you, you hold somebody to some high standards and tell them to work hard and people lose their minds. So anyway, there's that. Um, and, and like I said, this book, no matter what, regardless, every, every person should read this book because the, the way that it's written. So I read it and then I also found an audio book and maybe I'll have to figure out how to link the audio book. It's whatever one is free on Kindle because it's so old that there's no copyright on it really anymore. Um, so it's free if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, I guess. But the guy that read that book, unbelievable, great voice. Um, really easy to listen to, um, but everybody should read this book because this guy, this is a guy talking about having coming up from nothing and making something out of himself through really hard work and persistence and having good character and being a loving person instead of being hateful. I mean, come on. So leadership or not, go read the book. It's unbelievable. And it, like I said, I just don't understand why it's not required. Um, and he talks about that for everybody to have dignity, including the blacks. Um, he talks about that you should have property. 
So you should own something because then you're not going to break it. You should have industry, skill, economy, intelligence, and character. This is what was the essential, essential for the success of anybody. I mean, it's just, it's so obvious, right? But I don't understand why this example is not upheld all the time. All right, so the philosophy, as we do with all the leadership books, we're going to go and compare um, Mr. Washington up against uh, the philosophy, which, as we've talked about, or I've said a couple of times, I'm willing to admit, maybe instead of it being called the philosophy, it is the four essential pillars of character, the four essential characteristics, the four pillars of, I don't know, I don't know. Because you see a lot of people talking about character, but nobody defines what that means, as we've said before. All right, so did he have humility? Absolutely. Many times he'd talk about the fact that I couldn't believe that, one, he'd been picked to lead the Institute, two, that anybody thought that he was doing anything right, three, he'd get these big donations of money and talked about how appreciative he was all of the time, receiving letters from people, you know, the, the woman that brought the six eggs, he said that was the one of the donations that stuck the most in his mind because here's somebody that had nothing and gave six eggs. And he thought that was more impressive than people that were donating thousands of dollars. That's humility, right? And, and not fake humility, not obsequiousness, right? Not just, not just all that sort of stuff. But he was, he was consistently amazed that people were doing such great things. At one point, um, there were some people that raised money for him to go on a vacation because he never took one. So they sent him to Europe. But a bunch of people raised money to give to him to send him to Europe. And he couldn't believe that either. Just amazed, right? So absolute had humility. Integrity. Again, absolutely. Uh, there's a couple of examples where they were trying to build uh, or construct a couple of buildings on campus. And there was a guy that owned a lumber yard that said, hey, I want to help. I'll just give you the lumber and you pay me back when you can. He said, nope, we're not going to do that until I can give you a down payment. And, you know, and then I proceeded to do that. Um, and then the thing that I really thought was interesting is he went around and gave speeches in the North and the South. And he wanted to make sure that the speeches should be created, I mean, with a couple of things for the North or the South, but that they should be able to be delivered in both places without offending anybody or not or not offending, but making anybody mad. So he didn't go up into the north and scream about how corrupt and terrible the south was. He didn't talk about how crazy and whatever the north was in the south. And to me, that's integrity, right? I'm going to make sure that whatever I'm saying, I can say anywhere. Although as a speaker, you do tailor your message to a certain extent, but that's absolutely integrity. Um, and he talks about pay, you know paying off his debts and, and having credit and all that sort of stuff and you know, absolutely had integrity. Uh, empathy, yes. So he talks about losing sleep because when the when the institute first started out, they didn't have any sleeping arrangements. They had some little ram ramshackle cabins. Didn't have enough blankets. Didn't have mattresses. Didn't have beds. Didn't have anything. Didn't have enough heat. And he said he'd go out and check on people in the middle of the night. You know, he had a place to sleep, but he'd go out and check on people in the middle of the night. He would try to get coats for people, taught people how to make mattresses and how to make beds. And as soon as they could get a little bit of money, they were worried about that. So the first thing that he did was take care of people's living conditions. Second thing he did was worry about their food. Um, and he wor you know, talks about worrying about the fact that the food was bad and the food service was bad and all that sort of stuff. And talks about losing sleep over the fact that the students were having to suffer. Right? How amazing is that, right? Yeah, he's the big boss and he's worried about his people. I mean, like I said, this, this stuff is all obvious. To, I mean, to anybody that's paying attention, by this point in our, in our series, take care of your people, take care of the environment. Vigilance. Now, I love this one, right? So he set high standards, right? Um, talked about the, the health and cleanliness of the student was of utmost importance made sure that he expressed the importance of having all the buttons on their clothes, making sure that their shoes were clean, uh, and made sure they have a toothbrush. And, and the funny thing about the toothbrush is he mentions that 
it was such a big deal about having a toothbrush at the Tuskegee Institute that um, that would be sometimes the only thing students would show up with in the clothes on their back. Even if they had no money, they'd show up with a toothbrush because word got out. But then he talks about the fact that he would go inspect the living conditions. He'd inspect the food. He'd go and check their appearance at the end of class or the beginning of class. And he would walk through and inspect the male living areas. And then he had the principal, whatever the female principal was, um, he would walk through with her and check on the women. And so, you know, there you go. Set the high standards and then go and check. Because he said, you have pride in yourself, you have pride in your work, then you're going to go have pride in your studies, and you're going to go off and be a great human being. I mean, yeah. So there it is right there. Humility, integrity, empathy, vigilance. And then you talk about it over here with, uh, you know, character is what everybody should have. Well, I think these are the characteristics that people should have at a minimum, right? Now, having these characteristics, as we've said before, doesn't necessarily make you a leader, but it makes you a good person, right? Um, sorry, I'm just checking my notes. Um, okay. So next, the talent. Did he have the talent? Absolutely. So he's consistently picking the most competent person, focused on the environment and the environmental conditions to achieve the goals. Now, what I thought was interesting is the only goals that he expressly set out were living conditions, furniture, student welfare, uh, student appearance. He never really talked much about the quality of the education which I found interesting because what was he really worried about teaching? He didn't set out to make people these great scientists. He set them out to be good citizens, right? Going to teach how to work, teach how to present yourself well, and, and send you out into the world, right? And so that's what I found interesting. And then he talks about just trying to get funding for the school and the next building. You know, they needed a chapel, they needed a church. Uh, they needed a library, so he went and talked to, I just forgot, Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, um, to get some funding for a library. And that's what I thought was interesting as well, as he said, hey, look, you know, my, I found it very, very easy to get donations from businessmen because he would just go and explain, here's what I'm going to produce if you give me some money for this building or for this thing and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so always talks about it. He talks about uh, later on in his career when he was doing a lot more traveling and speaking. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, people said, well, how can you keep an eye on the school? Well, he had uh, the finance guy was sort of the pr the principal or the president while he was away. And would send reports every day, which I don't know if we did it through Telegraph or what. They didn't talk about how. But that's the way that he kept the tabs on things. And, I mean, he had everything reported. How much food, how much, you know, what was it, how much butter, how much uh, wheat had been used, who had called out absent, all that sort of stuff. So I'm assuming it was a Telegraph to wherever he was, Telegram. Um, but you just hear him all the time talking about, here's the standard, here's the environment. Here's the goal. We're going to go do it. So where did he learn this? Right? Where did he learn this? Now, General Armstrong, there's not a lot written about him, was a guy that identified him at the Hampton Institute and said, hey, I think I want you to go do this thing take or create the Tuskegee Institute. And, you know, what, what made him, I mean, he didn't sit down and teach Mr. Washington all of this stuff. So... This is somebody that was born with the talent and then had the right character and was able to get things done. So, you know, I, I just think it's uh, reading the book. It's a great it's 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 not a great story. It's a great recounting of history and and just seeing that the, the sort of people that existed 120 years ago, we could not do we could do a lot worse than trying to be like him. Okay, so 
a little bit shorter with the video this time, I understand. Um, so Up From Slaver, this is the original cover. And a little bit of history just to make everybody understand. It was published in this newspaper periodical, whatever you want to call it. He did a chapter at a time in this book. I mean, in this uh, in this publication. And then once it was done, they put it together and published it. So obviously you can get it from anybody. I mean, it's free online in PDF form. Um, I know, like I said, that the Amazon Kindle, if you've got the Amazon Prime membership or whatever, it's included. You can just get it for free and listen to it. Um, so there's no excuse to not read this book. Um, and, and the sort of example that was set. And, and so, you know, go out and do it. And, uh, that's really all that I had for the, for the, for the thing. It's just so, it's so reflexively, not reflexively, it's so inherently visible or readily apparent when you're reading the book that this was somebody that was a leader, right? It, his, his interest in himself was very low and his interest in everybody else around him was very high. And they all together created this amazing thing. I mean, the Institute and everything else around it was built by the students with donations from people, but it was with materials made by the students. So he taught all these people how to make this. So the Tuskegee Institute, which maybe at some point I'll be able to go visit, that might be fun. I have to figure out how to do that. Um, go do like a video tour, because I'm sure they've got some historical library to Mr. Washington there. Um, so a couple other books, there's two more books that were written by him that I have not read that I want to. One of them is a, a collection of papers about character. So it's some speeches that he gave to the students at the Institute about building character. And then another one is my continuing or my later education. Um, and that's where he has a couple of quotes that are famous now about uh, different perspectives on things. <laughs> Just leave that alone. Um, so yeah. Uh, like I said, hope you enjoyed this. But once again, this is somebody from 120 years ago did not go to any of our modern schools. Didn't go to any of our modern stuff. And this is what you got. Amazing, amazing results, right? Anyway, thanks so much for your time. And I just hope you have a great day.